Welcome. Thanks for listening to Cherry Beckard's Government and Public Sector Podcast Series. In each episode, we hear from the best in the business on the latest challenges, trends, and opportunities affecting the government and public sector. I'm Christian Fjolgrad, leader of Cherry Beckard's Government and Public Sector Industry Team. I hope you enjoy and thank you for joining us. Welcome everyone to Grants Management and Staff Transition, How to Stay Compliant in the Midst of Change, Episode 7 of our Grants Management Podcast Series. Jeez, can you guys believe <clears throat> that we are on Episode 7? It seems like we just recorded the first one yesterday. It's just crazy. So last week, we did an impromptu podcast on FEMA public assistance. It was supposed to be the podcast we're doing today, but in light of the situation with the hurricanes, we just did a uh, in-the-moment podcast instead to try to help with FEMA. <clears throat> but one thing we want to remind you, at least at the time of this recording, hurricane season is not over. So more communities could be affected through the next few months. We have I think it's Sarah turning up down there in the Gulf of Mexico, so let's hope she goes away. But um, we we can still be affected, and even after the season, it, you know, we have next year and the year after and the year after, right? Uh, the grants professional community really needs to be knowledgeable on these FEMA programs and how to apply and receive this assistance. It's essential for you for your communities to rebuild. So make sure you listen to that podcast we did last week, or not last week, our last podcast on FEMA public assistance and make sure you're, you are prepared for the future. That is so true. Um, thank you, Kat. I used to live in the South, so um, uh, on the Gulf of Mexico. So hurricane season, you know, I, I watch the calendar and wait for it to come and can't wait for it to be over. No um, kidding. I'm Kimberly Konzak, uh, a grants management enthusiast and proud member of a brilliant team of professionals um, that are providing grants management services end to end to our clients. Um, and it supports solutions and services for grant life cycle management. And with that, Kat, why don't you introduce yourself? And I am Kat Kizier. I am the Grants Management Solutions Lead and an Advisory Management Manager with Cherry Becker. I have over 20 years of experience in accounting and grants management. Uh, and if you listen to our last podcast, we introduced Paula Heller, our latest superstar added to our team and new co-host for the podcast. Yay, Paula. Why don't you tell us about yourself again? Well, thank you, Kimberly. A superstar. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, like Kat, I have over 20 years of experience in grants in a lot of different sectors in um, elementary, middle school and high school, in higher education and in research science, um, both on the writing and the post award management side. Awesome. So. Just to let you guys all know, we're going to do something a little different today than our usual format. So a little background on where this podcast comes from. I've worked in grants and accounting for over 20 years, as I said, and it never ceases to amaze me that organizations just cannot find experienced grants management staff. It's just not out there. And unfortunately, it's not much better today than it was 10 or 15 years ago. As a former government grants worker and now working as a consultant, I am pretty pessimistic when it comes to expecting any organization to be fully compliant with grants because they don't have the experienced grant folks on their team. So first of all, kudos out there to anyone who has a great grants management team working for them. You are very lucky. So Paul and I, and I'm sure Kimberly as well, are constantly being asked questions from our clients or listeners. How do I better my grant staff and my processes? How do I make this particular situation better? I don't want to lose my funding or return money to the grantor. No one wants that. So today we're actually going to answer some questions that you guys have posed to us either through social media through uh, an email from listening to a podcast or reading an article where we're trying to figure out how do you get good experienced grant staff and the importance of that as well. How do you go about doing that? So 
Paula, Kimberly, and I, we're going to go through three real-life staff transition issues that you guys have provided us. And we're going to provide this whole audience with the tools that you can use to help remedy some of those pesky transition situations when it comes to grants, staffing, grant staffing. So, Kimberly, start us off. All right. Question number one comes from Ben, who works for a local government. He writes, our grants department is a revolving door. We have had three grant managers in three years, and we cannot retain grant staff. We are a small local government, and it is difficult to have other employees fill in for the grant positions. What can I do to make this process easier for our staff? They are already overworked and not happy about taking on new responsibilities. Who's going to tackle this one? I will. That's a great question. And I think really one of the, the first things to do is to stop and, and think about Ben and how he's had three different grant managers in three years. So getting to the root cause of that, I think, is, is maybe his first step before figuring out how to fix um, the gap that he has right now. So I'm wondering, is it a compensation issue? You know, he needs to revisit his pay scale if that's the issue and use the roles and responsibilities to see if he can reclass the position. Um, or maybe the job description is not accurate and the person shows up to do the work and realizes it's a very different job. So hopefully he's done some exit interviews with his last three grant managers and has gotten some good information. Um, the other piece could be that it's inefficiencies in grants or in other departments that's causing this frustration. Maybe the policies and procedures aren't understood or developed very well, or they're not being put into practice. Maybe the accounting has high hope turnover too, so the general ledger um, for creating reports is a challenge. Or maybe it's been I mean, we don't know. He sounds sincere in his question, but maybe he's not a great leader motivating and supporting his team. And so it's making it hard to keep people. I think the point is Ben needs to do a deep dive into the root causes of this turnover rate and take corrective action to remedy it if he wants someone to stay in the position. What do you think, Kat? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I hope it's not Ben. Um, hopefully he's a good manager, but you never know. Uh, but, you know, you know, maybe he needs some management training. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. I think the other piece is, OK, so what his real question asked was, how do I put a Band-Aid on this problem I keep having? You know, it's a burden when you're down on a position and it's an open position. It takes time to onboard people and other people have to pick up the slack. Um so I wonder, does he have like a, a tracking system for all of his awards, um, like a master spreadsheet with all the details, the performance period, the budget period, the award amount, reporting deadlines? Does he have something like that so that he can keep his hands on what's actually happening during this gap time? And then I think he's going to have to start looking on a person by person basis and reallocating some of the work. So, for example, he may need to take um, a three-person team and pull one person off half of their work and give a portion of that work to the other two people so that that person can, can work on grants. And so this gets like a little tricky, but creating those clear roles and responsibilities and who's ultimately responsible for the grant work and who's picking up the slack and the other parts of the team. That I think um, is more work for everyone, but at least there's an equitable distribution and clear lines. Yeah, I, I completely agree with those recommendations. Those are great. And that assessment. And it's it's really important to have a succession kind of plan, especially when you're in positions where you know you have high turnover. What's going to happen if that position is empty and how will that work actually get accomplished in the long run? That's great. Thank you both for that answer. Okay, so next question. This one is from Delia, who works at a not-for-profit. She writes, we are a not-for-profit in the healthcare industry. We recently received a large amount of new funding. We do not have a grants department, and the grants tracking we do is very decentralized. We realize that we are in need of some type of centralized grant oversight or department. 
how do we go about setting the foundation for this? Can we use our current staff and transition duties? We have no clue where to start. <laughs> oh, this one is fun and it's also very complex. What do you think, Paula? It sure is. And I think it's not uncommon if you really think about how organizations get into the grant um, receiving business. You know, odds are they didn't put together a whole team and, and set up an office, write their policies and procedures, do dress rehearsals with how does the accounting look. They just basically didn't do the entire thing because probably someone said, hey, let's write a grant. And they started writing grants and all of a sudden they started getting funding. So I think that's typically how organizations enter into these funding situations. It's just by happenstance and they have to do all that work on the backside. So Delia, you're not alone. This is not totally unique. I think the solution is somewhat straightforward. I think you definitely have to have a dedicated grant team that's at least one person and they're ultimately responsible for all things related to grants, the accounting, compliance, all reporting. And then depending on the dollar amount, the nature of the awards, who the funders are, you might also need a financial analyst and a program analyst to assist with the awards. But Kat, what would you say about that? Right, right. Uh, so let's talk pre-award strategy for a minute. Before you ever receive or even think about applying for funds, <clears throat> you need to know what you can handle, what your capacity is, right, for your organization. Can you sustain this actual grant program? But how do you go about doing that? And how do you build that solid foundation and build up from the ground on that? So here's a few suggestions. Analyze first your staffing structure. Will you need to hire folks to carry out this grant program? Do you need to hire folks to, to write the grant proposal? Can you train other folks in your organization who are already doing certain jobs to also include into their positions, as we has, uh, kind of talked about before, include into their positions the new grant management functions? Or do you have to go out there and are you going to have to hire new people to do these things? There's just not enough hours in the day for everyone to do everything, right? <clears throat> so how will the new grants management function function actually fill up an eight hour day for a new hire? So there's a lot of details when it comes to time and effort and staffing. There's a lot of things to look at for your organization. What kind of costs are gonna be involved if you have to go out there and hire more people? What's the workload going to be if you have to incorporate these jobs? So first of all, think about and assess what your staffing level is and can you handle it, feasibly handle it financially too as well. Create a budget going into the financial part. So folks, Rome wasn't built in a day and your grants department will not be built in a day. Start as soon as possible looking at what your grants department will need to look at for your upcoming funding. So when you're looking at that proposal, if you get that grant award, make sure that you realize what it's going to cost you to actually incorporate that funding into your organization and provide the program that the actual grant is asking you to provide. So make sure that you go in and you, you have everybody on board. Make sure you're discussing this with your board, your CEO, everyone that needs to be involved and create that budget to support that grant funding. And then again, as we're talking about, find an experienced grant manager. The hardest part probably of everything. If you have an accounting department, you have your budget, you can do that strategy part. But now you have to find an experienced grant manager. If you already have one that knows the ins and outs, this isn't a new grant or it's a new grant, but you already have grants, that's awesome. Just make sure that grant manager is experienced enough to understand that this grant is different, may have different terms and conditions, may have different rules and regulations. A good grant manager or a really good grant staff will know what to look for in your grant proposal, in the grant uh, NOFO or the Notice of Funding Opportunity, and know what kinds of things that you will need to do from your organization to support this grant. Um, they'll know what policies and procedures you need. Someone will have to write those if it's a new grant and you haven't had grants before. Um, 
They'll know the T's and C's, like I said. They'll know how to manage, say, you have subrecipients in this new grant. That's a whole new ballgame if you've never had subrecipients before. Make sure you have a grant manager, you either hire one on or your grant manager is trained to understand how to deal with subrecipients. Um, just don't take for granted the importance and the worth of a good grants manager, grants coordinator, grants accountant. Just don't take for granted the worth of a good grants manager and staff and what they offer to you. Make sure you are looking at the industry standard compensation for them. I know when you're a government, local government, especially it's really hard because there's a lot of steps to go through to hire anyone and try to get uh, a compensation that is industry standard. But do your best to do that and make sure that um, just remember that their worth is important. Uh, involve the right people in your decision making. You want finance, project managers, department heads, and procurement all together and involved in the grant process. Each of them have a role to play. And if any of them are not on board, you need to get them on board and make sure they understand that there's certain things with grants that aren't the same per se with a regular operating fund. If you're in finance and things like that, certain terms and conditions that have to be followed. So make sure all the stakeholders in the, that are in your grant world are part of this grant process. And then finally, set your team up to minimize failure. Don't underestimate time and effort. Don't underestimate training. Grants is always changing. It's dynamic. That's never the same. Things are updating, changing every day. Make sure you have the training and stay updated on all those things to ensure your compliance with that grant or that you can comply if you're in the pre-award stage. Um, and just remember the consequences of poor compliance, financial, reputational, and your community could suffer as well, depending on the type of the grant. So those are some steps that I would suggest that everyone look at prior to getting the grant. And you can see where you can start building your grants department from that and have a really solid foundation if you start off with, with all of these kind of steps and procedures and processes before you actually get awarded the grant. I think that's a great list of all the things you need to be thinking about at that stage. And if Delia can answer these questions and have that thought process and find the right grant manor, manager, it's really the key to her success. So thanks for that great answer, Kat. So Kimberly, what is our next question? All right. Well, I don't envy Delia, but um, with these <laughs> steps, I think that can make her life hopefully a little bit easier. All right, final question. This one is from Marta, who works for a county government. And I quote, where in the world do you find good experienced grant professionals? I have had a grant specialist position open for months and have interviewed two people. Neither I would call good or experienced. We have around 115 grants and I need someone qualified to fill this position. Marta has a really good point. This is not um, a career path that's a very traditional path. Like you go to college for four years, you do an internship and then you start working. People typically fall into the grants world, and if they fall in love with it, they stay if it's a good fit. Um, but until recent history, the demand has not been great for this career, and that's why it's difficult to find grant professionals. The first piece of advice I would give her is to make sure that she joins and becomes members of different grants communities. So for example, National Grant Management Association, NGMA, or Grant Professionals Association, GPA. They have job boards, they have a uh, rich network of like-minded people that she can reach out to. Um, another idea would be for her to look within her own grant community for upward mobility. If she's got 115 awards, she has program leaders, she has program directors, she's got some management level positions. Maybe there's someone with a little bit of training uh, that could move upward and fill this need. You don't always have to bring in someone from the outside. 
another recommendation I would have would be to use a recruiting service. This is what they specialize in. They go out into the working world and find people that meet the criteria that you need. Uh, typically, you have to bring them in on a contract basis, maybe 90 days or 120 days. But if that person works out at the end, you hire them and it gives you a great opportunity to test whether someone has the skills that you need to do this important job. You know, <clears throat> Paula mentioned NGMA, National Grants Management Association, and they're one of the great places to go to look for good talent. They do have a job board. There's also the Grants Professional Association, which is GPA. They also have a great job board for grants professionals. And um, these two organizations are probably the two biggest grants management organizations out there at this time. Uh, National Grants Management Association has a certification program. And if this give you any indication of how difficult it can be to find a grants management professional who really has good compliance background, there are probably 350 certified grants management specialists in the nation. And that's not a lot. So going there to look, um, it's a great place. It's also a great place to ask questions as well if you're looking for some advice for grants management professionals or, or from grants management professionals as well. It is a small but growing profession. It's just the problem for most organizations is just that it's it's its own language, it's its own its own little little part of the business world that other people don't understand. And that's when we're saying hire a really if you can hire a really good grants professional, just do it. That's a, I think that's a critical point. It will be uh, the hill that you die on if you can't make that choice. Um, the, and I think one of the things I'll follow up with, Kat, on your point is uh, the limited number of people that have really reached that highly qualified level. Um, and it's because it's an emerging field. For the last couple of decades, the federal government has nearly doubled the amount of funding that it's given out. And so we see like in 2000, it was 300 billion. A decade later, it's 600 billion. A decade later in 2020, it's 1.1 trillion. And so one of the things you see is the federal government is decentralizing its spending um, and increasing its oversight, and they're using grant funds to do it. And so they have to write strategic plans. They have to update them consistently if I'm a federal agency. And now at this point, I'm giving money to the state. The state's giving money to other organizations and other nonprofits. And so that money is really being passed out. The problem is we don't have a strong grant professional community at all those different levels to fill in the gap. So it's a classic supply and demand problem. Supply of fund is high, the demand for individuals that can do this work is high, but the workforce is still underdeveloped. So puts a lot of that federal money at risk. So do what Kat said, build a great grant professional team and compensate them as competitively as possible. Right. More money, more problems is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thank you, Kat and Paula, for joining us for today's podcast. You can reach us at Kimberly.Konzak at CBH.com, Kat.Kizier at CBH.com, and paula.heller at cbh.com. Our next podcast will be the American Rescue Plan Act, the last minute effort. Sounds a little scary, but that obligations deadline is December 31st of this year. Do you know where your funding stands? We sure hope so, but also wanna help you with that deadline, even if it is last minute. Thank you to our audience for listening in today, and remember to subscribe to the series at www.cbh.com forward slash cherry dash Beckert dash podcasts forward slash. This is Christian again. I hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to our next one. Don't forget to subscribe.